Um, my father was absolutely, he was reasonably young, and he, you know, my father liked to drink. He was kind of a very man's man and drank a lot. It just seemed to be around a lot. It seemed to be a lot of the experience, you know, and, and I was sort of drinking by the time I was about 11, really. And the first time I drank, I got too drunk and got caught, and, and then it just escalated from there um, into drugs and, you know, I was seeking out other, you know, addicts and, and alcoholics and, you know, I, I never felt like I fitted in at school, so I looked for the other guys that didn't fit in and, you know, we wouldn't go to school and, you know, we would sniff glue and, you know, all that kind of stuff and drink. Um, and I may end up in school in a blackout, you know, kind of being escorted off the premises or, you know, doing something strange. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I seeked out lots of other people exactly like me. I mean, I still have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of under, uh, uh, identification and understanding of that young man now. Um, it's taken me a long time to get there. Um, but yeah, I understand, you know, I understand a lot more about that young man and, you know, where he came from and, and, and his struggles and his frustrations about life and what I thought it was going to entail. You know, the responsibilities of life and, and just didn't want to do it really, you know. Was pretty scared about the whole issue of growing up. Uh, and didn't know how to kind of get support about growing up. You know, the only place I got support was from through alcohol and drugs. I, I, I'd been let down a lot, and I think my attitude at, uh, at an age was that, you know, I assumed that you didn't care, you know, being anybody around me, adults. Um, so I stopped caring, and, and I behaved in that way, you know. So, of course, when you behave in that way, <laughs> please get involved, you know. And I was arrested, uh, and the more I got arrested, the more it became a kind of us and them situation. And, and yeah, I mean, I didn't like authority. I didn't like being told what to do. I wasn't gonna conform. Um, and they were just gonna be part of the consequences of my decisions that you were the, that you were the enemy. And I was gonna incur them consequences. The impact I had, you know, on my family and my children was, was immense and, and that still comes to light today. You know, my father's at the end of his life at the moment and I'm having conversations with him now and, and from a grown up stance now, you know, listening to my father talking about his son and I have two sons saying, you know, son, what it's like to watch your son killing himself, you know, when I know he can do better and, 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 and I'm feeling them words. The day I chose to turn my life around, uh, I was in a prison in London, in a segregation unit for six weeks, I'd been in there. I was about nine stone, long hair, couldn't walk around the yard, you know, for, I had to go back in because I was so unwell and, uh, and unfit. And I went to see my two sons uh, on a visit behind a glass screen and I walked up the stairs in a pair of slippers because you're not allowed shoes because it's a segregation unit, you know, they're frightened of violence. And, and I walked up and I walked in the room and I saw my two sons sitting there looking at me. And I hadn't seen them for three months, you know, before that. And it, I'd gone very deteriorated very quickly at this point. And they were looking at me as if to say, who's this man? You know, and, and there was a moment where I didn't say it. I didn't have to express it to anybody. I knew I was going to change. And I just looked at them and said, this is it. And this is where it stops. I didn't know how it was going to, but I knew that that moment had come. And I went back down into the cell, cried for two days, you know, to just to kind of the realisation of, of the state of my life. But the seed had been planting and somehow events started to happen that, that shouldn't, you know, really have happened considering my record and considering my life. Um, and, you know, officers and people started to say, oh, did you want to go here, you know, and I'll offer things that would never have been offered before. And I took the opportunity and, and so it seemed to be from my intention, my internal intention, external things started to change and I started to see the opportunities and I took opportunities, you know, for change. I got, uh, I say, a, a miraculous opportunity to go to a prison at a treatment centre and this officer said to me, you can go to this prison, I'm going to swap you for another prisoner. If you come back here, I will cause you many problems. And he was very serious about that. And, and, and he must have seen something in me or, you know, and he read my records and off I went. I well, basically came across, you know, fellowships, a rehabilitation for Addictive Prisoners Trust. Um, and I saw the first step, basically. You know, and, and my history was in prison, come out, start again. You know, I was powerless. I was sitting back in prison going, how did I get here? 
you know, and, and it started to make sense to me and it was a, it was a process of undoing for a, for a while. Um, and that was, and that extended to moving out, coming out of prison and, you know, and integrating that into my life in, in the world, basically. RAPT is an organisation that works within the prison, um, uh, similar to SHARP, uh, similar programme, um, and it works basically within, you know, within prisons and you generally, uh, used to be, they segregate you slightly from the other prisoners and you have to stay clean, obviously, and go to meetings and do, and you do a set of steps and, you know, and it was a... It was good for me. It was, it was the only place I was ever going to get it cornered. You know, there's two ways out, go back to my old life or, or get recovery. And, and that's personally what I needed, being so uh, ingrained in my illness. Yeah, I relapsed, yeah. I, I, I relapsed after a time, um, recognising, you know, parts of my recovery that weren't addressed, you know. Um, but I stayed in recovery for a relatively long time before that happened. Very committed and, you know, very, uh, and, you know, I'm back very committed. You know, I, I see that as, a, as a, I learned a lot from that, from the relapse. But it was a long process. I had no tools for life. I didn't kind of have a, you know, anything. I, I'd been a criminal, you know, uh, from a very young age. So I had no credentials. I had, you know, I had qualifications. I did. Where could I go for a job with my record? You know, I, I didn't have any, so I started very much from the beginning. And it was a process of kind of meeting the world with the support of friends and, you know, family and, and, and just sort of ambling my way through, really. At, at college again with lads of 16, 17, you know, sort of at 31 years of age. It was, it was good fun, you know, it was, yeah, yeah, I, I enjoyed it and, you know, and worked hard at it.